um, to help, help us build the, the site and, and really achieve this big vision. And so when you work at Inventables, there's a couple of unique things to our company that you should think about. So one is we like to celebrate. And so three days ago, you see that that was the biggest bottle of champ uh, champagne that money could buy. We celebrated the first dollar that was traded through our website. And so it took about a year from the time we kind of conceived it to actually got the credit card processes up. But the two guys who worked on the site are sitting back there, Jeff and Drew. And we made a buck and we popped champagne. So this is the team that we have. But it's a very momentous occasion, both for me professionally and us as a business, because we finally sold a scalable dollar. Nobody talked to the guy who, who paid the dollar and nobody talked to the, the buyer who submitted the inquiry. So if you go back to the entrepreneur map, this is very important. So over the next few years, we're gonna scale it um, to be millions. So part of, so, so I consider that, that piece of celebrating success to be part of being goal focused, and we're very focused on this goal, and when we achieve them, we celebrate. So the other part is exploration. And this is, every month we have an exploration to get our team just out of the office, to think differently. And the only rule is that you have a budget and a different person decides what the team exploration is. And so this is a picture of one, one afternoon we went and kayaked the Chicago River. And it was an architectural tour. And this is like Tuesday or Thursday afternoon and we're just kayaking down the river for a couple of hours. Somebody in the office picked this. And the, the idea is to just get out of the office because all of the same sort of thinking processes happen when you go through the same behaviors. But then if you go out here, you might think like, huh. I hadn't thought about it in that way. The other thing, so another, another exploration, we just went to Flashpoint Academy, which is a technical school in downtown Chicago, and this is Howard Tolman, who is a serial entrepreneur, demonstrating for us their green screen room of how they put students on uh, TV and movies. So the other thing with explorations is we started trying to build a community of technology folks, startup folks in Chicago. And so I teamed up with uh, Brian Fitzpatrick from Google, and we started uh, a technology conference for Chicago called Org Camp happened last January, and then Org Sessions. So Org Camp was about 90 people, it was programmers, engineers, um, our customers, some Google folks, and it was free, we just provided food for everybody, and the audience <coughs> decided what the topics were. And so part of being at Eventables is, is being part of this, this energy or this enthusiasm, then we decided we also wanted to, to recruit the best engineers and get open source be more prevalent in Chicago and round up these guys. So we started this thing called Ort Sessions, where about once a quarter, we invite people to come to our office. Again, free food, and the only stipulation is you build open source software, throw it online, and then do a show and tell. So we did the first one in June, and the second, second one's gonna be October 21st. In our office, when we're developing the software, we use agile software development. So if you haven't heard of that, you should check it out. And also, pair programming. So this is a picture uh, pair programming going on in our office. And, and one of the cool things about pair programming is it gets both developers engaged and focused on what's going on and also gets their mind shirt around all the different parts of our code base. So it's, you, you, you tend to not go off into islands, and so we have a lot less bugs in our, in our code base because two people are thinking about it and, and working on it every single day. Um, the other part is so because we're doing agile software development, we, have, we, we measure things in points rather than time. So measures of complexity, we like to think of it in t-shirt sizes, small, medium, large. So on Fridays, we have this thing called Free Point Friday. And the only rule is there's no accountability. As a programmer, you work on what you think is the most important. And that's it. And if you don't deliver anything, that's fine, because it's really what you think is important. And so some of the best features have come out of it. That's it, so I invite you to join us. If you have any questions, you can email me, or you can ask right now. Yeah. For a startup, what's the usual ideal size of people to work together? I, I don't think there's an ideal size. I would say more than that is just do it. Just, just get started, get, get some sort of prototype, get some sort of, um, some, just start something so you can get some feedback. So while you were transitioning the company to the sort of web without people idea, were you yeah. still sending out these sort of care packages, or was that put on hold? So we, we set a date, 
that was in the future that said, like, at this date, we're no longer going to be doing this uh, business model. Uh, we're full transition, which is why I raised the money to make sure that if I was wrong and we made a little cushion, that we had it. How did you get people coming to the Inventables, the news site, where you're not contacting anybody? I mean, it seems like you didn't do any SEO or any of that stuff. Well, so, I mean, we did SEO. Basically, most of our traffic comes from the search engines. People already want this stuff. But then also, a large percentage come because they already know Inventables, just because we've been around for seven years now. And so, for, for our customers, like, you think about, oh, I need a new material, they just think Inventables, and they already go there. So we, we built a little bit on our brand name, and then we also used the search engines. Uh, how many people are at the company right now? Today, there's 10. Uh, when you were starting out, how do you prove your legitimacy to all these companies when you're selling yourself? So you're saying, well, we, how do we prove it with the medibles? So originally, like when we had no customers, you were just you were just convincing them that this is worth a try. And if you read Jeffrey Moore's book, Crossing the Chasm, he, he talks about the people who will listen to you are the early adopters. And you know they, they don't really care that, that you don't look perfect and you don't look like IBM Global Services. They're like, ooh, this is interesting. I'm willing to pay a little bit because I see the value. And really, like, they just kind of believe. But then once you get those first people, then the way we built legitimacy with the rest of the people is we showed the logos of the first people. The second people were like, look. <laughs> like, Decker thought it was good. Don't you? And they're like, yes, I do. <laughs> Procter & Gamble's a good one. You get Procter & Gamble, then everybody wants to go to Procter & Gamble. So. <laughs> Quotes and logos. If you go to salesforce.com's homepage, Quotes and logos. They don't even tell you what the product does. <laughs> yeah? Uh, what's the structure of the company right now? I think, so we converted, when we got the investment, from an LLC to a C-Corp. Uh, are you like, playing around on high credit by $7,000 or $120,000 like, in your investment safety? <laughs> Very carefully. So <laughs> you set clear expectations on what $7,000 meant and what $120,000 meant. So in their minds, it, we, we gave them an analogy where this was a Camry and this is a Lexus. And we tried to clearly, we changed the name, so one was Design Aid, one was Innovation Center. And we tried to very clearly communicate and set expectations. This isn't gonna exist anymore. This is gonna be the new thing. Do you wanna do that? And we had to basically, it ended up, you couldn't have that conversation over the phone. We had to literally fly out and like have an in-person back and forth, because everybody understood it a little differently, used a little bit different language. But then once we had a basic understanding of what this new thing was, and they're like, okay, got it. And then they would sign it. Oh. Yeah. yeah. So would you say that like, when you're just starting out, that the price determines quality? I mean, if you, I mean, if, I guess you have to make a lot of changes to show that it's really worth it, but like if you're offering something that's new that doesn't really have a fixed price in people's minds, so you would you say that price determine like, like a, you know, if you have 7,000 to 120,000, you make a lot of changes, but like, if you, I mean, if you said off of the same thing for less, would people think it's worth less? Or, I mean, is that at a high price that people automatically kind of assume that it's like more valuable? Or what's the thing? So in the beginning, I would give it away for free, because if people aren't willing to take it for free, it's probably not even worth um, developing a price for it. But then, it's a very hard problem. Like, the approach that I use is just, I just kept raising it until they said, like, it's too much. Um, it's not a very good answer, but it's a hard problem. Yeah? Initially, when you were in the prototype stage, you were thinking of ideas. You said you put a budget of $100 in the day. Yeah. Where did that initial budget come from? It came from the sale of the first company. But so it, 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 constraints helped with creativity, so just do $10 a day. I was just like buying like markers and um, I would go to Michael's or like Home Depot and just like buy something. Just like to, oh, what can I do with this? But you, you can do, if you're doing a web startup, you can just do it with web pages. Um, it's just more the act of build something.